All right, welcome, welcome, welcome to the workshop tonight. Uh, it feels like it's been forever since we did a workshop. I know it hasn't been all that long, but it's uh, it's been a while. So um, on tonight's workshop, what we want to cover is what you don't know about nutrition. So uh, when we were talking about this topic and what we wanted to do for it, of course, you know, we wanted to cover one of the seven homeostatic essentials on nutrition, but there's so much out there on nutrition that is just kind of like the same stuff. And, you know, and you can read 1500 articles on it and every health website out there kind of like repeats the same things and everything. So we wanted to cover something a little bit unconventional, what you necessarily don't know about nutrition or you're not going to see elsewhere. So, uh, we're going to start with, um, a, a point that I don't know what I've really heard much anybody talk about. And that is, uh, eating your burgers is good for you, right? So, um, you know, this, this is a question or more just a, a point after having kids, you know, you, you, you start to notice a trend, right? That pretty much all kids eat their boogers. Uh, and you start wondering why, you know, and of course we as a culture and a society are telling, you know, making sure. And of course I did with my kids too. Oh my God, stop eat, you know, <laughs> stop picking your nose, you know, and, and, uh, you know, and all that. And we, you know, of course make a big deal about it. And, and I, I'm not here to tell you, you know, okay, yeah, you should eat your boogers, you know, uh, any more than some websites will tell you that you should drink your urine or you should take uh, encapsulated feces uh, tablets and stuff like that. There's, there's still things that, you know, I, I personally think you just shouldn't do. And uh, customarily, this is one of them. But, however, it is a very interesting topic when you really think about it because there is actually research to back this up. Uh, for example, just one is salivary mucins protect surfaces from colonization by karyogenic bacteria. So uh, I'm not recommending that, like I said, you you eat your boogers, but at the same time, there is evidence to support it. And when you think about it, it makes sense because here's just some common sense things that should tell us that there is a reason why animals and children uh, instinctively do it. Why? Uh, number one, identification of pathogens in the airway by the tonsils and other immune system organs, right? So your tonsils, if you still have them, uh, that's one of those organs that a lot of doctors just remove without thinking about it. They don't, you know, they, they expect that you're just gonna, oh, okay, well, we don't really need those, right? They're, they're just extra organs for whatever reason. Well, of course, every organ in the body has a reason and the tonsils are definitely one of them. Isn't it ironic not to get into that too too far, but that it's the sick kids, the repeat sick kids, that are the ones getting their tonsils removed. Okay, why is it the repeat sick kids that are always having swollen tonsils? Well, the answer is, it's not the tonsils that's the problem. It's the sick kid, and the tonsils are the ones that are trying to react to it constantly. You know, so if you just remove the tonsils, that's kind of like, I always say, uh, you know, you've got a hangnail on your finger. There's a way that you can make sure that you don't ever get a hangnail again. You just cut off your finger, right? And that sounds ridiculous, but that's exactly the way that the medical model tends to act when it comes to these extra organs, you know, wisdom teeth, tonsils, appendix, uterus, uh, ovaries, you know, all of these different organs, they just are like, well, you don't really need them. Let's just go ahead and remove them because then you won't have a problem with them anymore. Any organ that you take away, you, I, I guess you can't have a problem with that anymore. So the tonsils do identify pathogens in the airway and in the mouth and anything that travels into the body that's one of the first mechanisms that's there. And it's cool how science now knows that the, that the tonsils are the first, they're the, basically the early warning system. Think about it like a, like a car alarm or a, or a home alarm, that the minute that a window breaks or something like that, it sets off the alarm and it prepares the system. So by the time that something hits the tonsils, your gut is already starting to make an immune response to it before it gets there. This is so that you don't get sick when it gets down into the lower parts. Pretty cool stuff. So mucus is actually made primarily of mucins, which is the immune gel. Okay, so that 
goop that we think of as mucus is actually immune gel. I mean, it's, it's, it's the body's response to try to create an immune response to whatever it is that it's trying to evade. So, of course, you get bombarded by, uh, you know, spray paint or, you know, uh, dirty hay in a, in a farmhouse or uh, cat dander or whatever else it is, you know, you get hit by all this stuff and your body immediately starts to produce this immune gel to control all of it, right? And to capture all of it so that it doesn't create sickness and disease within the body. Okay. You, uh, and, and the other point is you already swallow it all day, every day. You know, we, we make a big deal about sticking your finger up your nose and then eating it. But the reality is every single one of us in here, every day you're swallowing mucus. It's just going down the backside. It's not coming out the front and then going down the other side. But you're literally swallowing mucus all day, every day. If you ever, you know, blow your nose or you're hacking and coughing, you know, you're, you're coughing up mucus. It's the same stuff. So it's just ironic that we make such a big deal about it. So I think, uh, you know, it's not really that surprising that you see kids have this natural affinity, this, this uh, um, you know, it, it's just a, it's just a natural, normal thing. They don't have to be trained to pick their nose and eat their boogers, right? It's like a dog out in the yard doesn't have to be trained to eat dirt when they feel sick. It's just nature in action. Pretty wild when you think about it. All right, next one here. Are germs really that bad? That's, that kind of goes hand in hand with it. So first of all, before we go into that, you, you get why I'm going into this a little bit, and I'm going to wrap it up you know, on the, on the end of my section, but already you might be thinking, why are we talking about germs and pathogens and stuff when we're talking about nutrition? Well, see, that's, that's the thing. We, we always think about nutrition as eating fruits and eating vegetables and how much fat and how much protein and all this stuff and, and diet and stuff. But, but I want to reframe our minds, you know, when we, you really think about the seven homeostatic essentials, the reason why the logo for nutrition is as it is with the stomach here, with all the pluses and minuses coming into it is because you, that's how you need to think about nutrition. There's only really two major inlets into the body, right? Through the nose and through the mouth. So anything that enters into the body is going through one of those passages. And so either way, you're really ingesting, okay? So it's those mechanisms of ingesting that is either a plus or a minus to the system, right? So yes, nutrition, you know, and good food and vitamins and stuff should be a plus into the system. But on the same hand, if you're taking a, a Tylenol with your, with your uh, multivitamin, you know, then that's a minus going in at the same time too. So nutrition needs to be looked at as what am I doing on the positive side versus what I'm doing on the negative side. So it's ironic to us when we see these, uh, you know, the, the crunchy crowd who is all adamant about, uh, you, know, you know, eating healthy and, and being so particular on some things, yet on the backside, you know that they're doing these other things too. And it's, and it's almost like it's perfectly acceptable. And it's like something hasn't really quite clicked that they're, they're not looking at the negatives. They're only looking, they're focusing on the positives. They're completely forgetting about the negative aspect of it. So in a sense, you know, you can kind of see how these intercorrelate, which they should, that respiration and nutrition kind of go hand in hand because one is ingesting through, you know, ingesting through the nasal passages. The other one is ingesting through the, through the oral orifice, right? And then detoxification is really a branch off of those two because that's how your body now deals with the things once they get into the system. Does that make sense? So, are germs really that bad then? If we're ingesting germs, we've been pummeled for the last two years about the danger of invisible pathogens, right? That you just, you can't be exposed to pathogens. If you get exposed to pathogens, it's tragedy in action. But you realize, again, that you ingest pathogens all day, every day. Every single second, your body is pulling in stuff through the air, 
Uh, it's pulling in stuff through your mouth. Every time you inadvertently put your hand near your face, I mean, even your lips are covered with pathogens. They're everywhere. You know, I hate to put it this way, but I often ask people, uh, you know, that are worried about wearing a face mask and stuff. I'm like, have you ever really thought about, you know, I mean, have you ever smelled a fart before? Because if you smelled a fart, you're literally breathing in what was just in somebody else's finish the sentence, right? Think about that for a second. Think about, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a wild thought, but you're literally breathing in what was just inside someone's rump. And, you know, we don't really make that big a deal out of it, but if anything should be a big deal, that should be a big deal, right? You know, we should be, we should be oh my gosh, you know, crazy give people butt plugs, right? You know, just to keep them from farting because that like should be the da most dangerous thing that we come in contact with. Uh, <laughs> so we ingest pathogens every single day, period. You can't get away from it. You shouldn't be that worried about it is what I'm getting at. You know, should you uh, practice good hygiene and everything? Absolutely. But you can't be so, you know, fearful of pathogens, um, you should realize that on the flip side of it, you're, you should be practicing things to keep those positives in balance so that your body can deal with that. And that goes to this kind of last point on this slide, the bubble boy. If you guys have never heard of this context, the boy in the bubble, uh, I think this movie was from the 1970s, 1980s. Uh, they made a John Travolta movie uh, that was about this. But David Vetter became famous after living in a germ-free plastic bubble for 12 years due to SCID, which is severe immunodeficiency. So the idea was that this, you know, this kid just couldn't be exposed to anything, right? So even a common cold could, could kill him. And now, of course, they don't do this because they realize we, you know, there, there's things that we can do to to actually improve the immune system so it's, it's less of an issue. So just containing someone in a plastic bubble does not protect them from the world, right? It's actually the opposite is true. You become weaker as you go. So it, should, it can be just the slightest thing that is eaten or whatever that eventually will kill you because your immune system just continues to underdevelop. Okay, what we now know today is that the immune system works better when exposed to pathogens on a regular basis as your microbiome and immune system work together to strengthen. That's really how we should look at it. So pathogens just aren't that bad. They're not that big of a deal. And that goes into the theories, okay? Terrain theory versus germ theory. Some of you have probably never heard of terrain theory before, okay? But this argument has been in play literally for, I don't know, close to 100 years. I mean, it's been around. This is nothing new, all right? So germ theory, of course, is the predominant idea why. Do you have any idea why germ theory is the predominant idea that has taken over, over the world? money, specifically who wants the germ theory as the primary force in play? Pharmaceutical industry, the medical model, because the medical model is supported by this theory because, and, and it could almost be flipped over and, and made the other way. It's not that the theory was the most viable, it's that they looked at the theories and said, this is the only one that's viable for our model. So if we make the germ theory the thing, well, then you know that if you get exposed to X, you can't do anything about it, so we have to give you a pill for that. If you get exposed to bacteria, we give you this, antibiotics, and that's the cure for that. If you get a virus, we're gonna give you this vaccine, and that's the cure for that, right? That is the germ theory in play. Wikipedia describes germ theory denialism, you literally can look up this term, germ theory denialism as the pseudoscientific belief that germs do not cause infectious disease and that the Louis Pasteur's germ theory of disease is wrong, okay? So they, they've created this whole term around it. Notice, though, that we still call it the germ theory, which tells you what? That it's not proven. Okay, these are theories. There's no way that you can really prove ultimately and conclusively that that's it. That's the end of the story. 
Uh, modern terrain theory describes that sickness does not come from exposure to pathogens alone, but is a complex interaction of immune modulation, the microbiome, the virome, exposure to pathogens, and interferences in immune system function. Okay, so a great way of looking at this is exactly what it shows here. The germ theory says just vaccinate the fish. So notice it's got the fish inside of a plastic bag inside of the fish bowl. So isolate it from its environment and then, and then give it things from the outside to try to make it more viable within that environment. Whereas the terrain theory says clean up the tank. If you clean up the tank, and you keep it clean, then the fish is probably gonna survive better. So which one just looks logically as a more viable theory, right? Uh, but now they're trying to kind of spin it around to where it's like, oh, well, see, the reason why we vaccinate is because, you know, that, that helps to even further improve the function of the fish. But that's just not the case. It's not the case with any drug. Anything, any chemical that you put into that fish tank is now poisoning the fish tank. It's not improving it, it's creating another interference that that fish now has to deal with because those chemicals don't belong in fish tanks or ponds or rivers. They're not natural substances. Okay, so this theory is primarily rejected by modern medicine as it destroys literally the entire premise of vaccination, which is modern medicine's current trajectory and its future for profits. If you look at the science and you look at where things are going, and especially over the last two years with COVID and the mRNA thing and all of the different vaccines that they have in the pipeline now, they're literally in the process of dozens of dozens of dozens of different vaccines that they have in the pipeline trying to push this because they know two things. Number one, pharmaceutical medications are expensive to create, right? So to get approval, they spend vast amounts of money to get them approved. And then once they do get them approved, they've got a limited window before it becomes a generic. And so they spend all of this money to get something on the market that they only have a patent on for a while, and then it's gone. So it's massively expensive to produce. Secondly, is they're never in the clear from a liability perspective. How many times have you seen a drug that comes on the market that is on the market for 10 years, then the lawsuits start piling in and it gets removed from the market? Yes, they made their billions, but they're gonna have to lose tens or hundreds of millions in the process. With vaccines, you don't have any of that. There's no liability in place as it stands right now. So they can make them cheap and they don't have to worry about liability. So that is the entire future trajectory of medicine. That's why the terrain theory is never gonna be the prominent theory. It just won't be, all right? Uh, so your toxin bucket overflowing, we pay far too much attention, literally, as you can see, to the wrong problems that we're looking at eating you know, organic broccoli as a close, as a, uh, compared to non-organic broccoli, like that's like the penultimate idea is we just have to eat all organic, yet these same people are taking antidepressants every day, are going to the doctor and getting uh, antibiotics every time something comes up, are still eating at you know, fast food chains, and, and they're not thinking about every time that they uh, as I say here, licking a, a plate, you know, that has been washed in a commercial dishwasher. You know, you don't know what chemicals are on the plates. You don't know what chemicals are on the silverware. You know, I mean, all of these different things we don't think about, but we're worried about one little detail of organic versus not organic. Not that it's not important, but that's only one part of the equation. That's not how you balance a checkbook. So, Think of all the, the, the toxins you ingest every day, detergents on dishes in homes and restaurants, air fresheners. You walk into a bathroom, a, pub, a public restroom, and you hear those, you know, the, the things that pop on the wall, right? You should be running out of the room when you hear those things. Like I literally, if I hear one go off, I'm, I'm covering my, my face with my shirt and getting out of there because those are some of the most toxic things that you can come across. Uh, fragrances, 
perfumes, you know, you, some, some people you walk past them and it's like, they're, you know, they'll, they'll walk past you in the store and you just, all of a sudden you just get a huge whiff of deodorant or, I mean, some of the deodorants are almost stronger than perfumes now. So, uh, ever touch food without sterilizing your hands like a surgeon, right? If you're touching your food in any way, shape, or form, you're probably getting pathogens and stuff on it. Handrails, door, door nose, doorknobs, gas pumps, all of these different things are just covered literally in feces, okay? Because most people don't wash their hands thoroughly. So, just about every surface that you touch has got feces on it. If you look in... You know, they, they've, I've, I've seen shows where they look in car seats and stuff and they, you know, take out the black lights and everything and they look at every substance that's on a seat and it's nasty, right? I mean, you, you have literally everything on there, but do you worry about it, right? When you, do you worry about, and, and do you, do you ask someone before you get in their car with them, you know, if, uh, you know, Hey, when was the last time you sterilized your seats, right? We don't look at this stuff. Breathing. Yes. With or without a mask, it literally is the same thing. So we've got to think about how our toxic buckets are overflowing. You know, this is a primary factor of nutrition because that bucket, it just depends on how much you're throwing in there as to how fast it's filling up versus detoxification, which is your body's mechanism of getting rid of those toxins, right? So this is building the bucket. Detoxification is taking it out. All right. Uh, so what is nutrition then? Exactly as our seven homeostatic essentials logo represents, nutrition is a complex balance of credits and debits. Some things credit, some things debit. Some credits are more than others and some debits are greater than others. The more credits, the healthier your account, the more debits, the sicker your account. It's that simple. Uh, we could spend days talking about all the things that are good for you. You could spend a lifetime reading online and arguing about what's good and what's better. There's literally, you know, websites where you get emails every day and they're 50 pages long, you know, and we'll get questions about, oh, well, what about this and this? And, oh, I heard it was good to take fecal, you know, fe uh, fecal implants, you know, and it's like, you know, a lot of this stuff just misses the big picture. So too often we forget that medications, toxins, vaccines, flu and COVID shots, the environmental exposure, they have much more reaching influence than we give credit to. So clean your tank first. That's one of the biggest factors. Then we talk about nutrition and, and what's better as far as what you put in diet wise. Does that make sense? All right. And I think at this point we turn this over. Hmm? There we go. Did it decide to die? I think it just decided to die. No, maybe. We'll see. All right, Doc. Do you want to sit over here? Let's see. Move the camera. Yes, sir. All right, guys. Uh, talking about our toxic bucket, I'm going to be talking a little bit of how we got to where we are uh, in America specifically. And I have just sad as the title of this slide. As we know, sad, most of us know. Uh, that means the star standard American diet. And uh, based on the guidelines given to us by the government, I think they call it my plate now at the top right, uh, it emphasizes you know, your vegetables, your fruits, uh, elimination of vegetable oils, or consumption of vegetable oils and elimination of natural foods like meats, uh, beef, chicken, things like that, while consuming things like soy products and more lean meats. Uh, more fat-free products here, uh, straight from the uh, FDA's website right there. But because of this, we now have heart disease as the leading cause of death. We have cancer as the number two in America. 46% of adults have diabetes or are pre-diabetic, 90% of which are overweight, and that is including type 1 and type 2 diabetes. We have the most spending out of any developed country on health care. $4 trillion a year, so $4 million million a year. Despite that, we still have the highest chronic disease burden. This is 28% of our population has been told that they have a disease that they will never, they will have the rest of their life. They'll never heal from, they'll never recover from. We have the highest obesity, highest rate of mortality uh, amenable to healthcare. That means we have the highest rate of death from disease and they have access to healthcare at the same time. So there shouldn't be an excuse. 
out of the highest 11th uh, or 11 highest developed countries. And that's from a, a research called the Commonwealth Fund. So how did we get to where we are? This is not the only uh, attributing factor to, to how we got where we are, but Crisco was a uh, definitely a player in this. Procter and Gamble were two stepbrothers, I believe, that started a, a soap company, and they found that they could create a solid product from cotton seed, and which was uh, you know extra cotton seed, which was dangerous to consume. It was g gossy. Gossy pol and cotton seeds is a pesticide, so they had to highly process this, and they found that they could uh, consume it as well. So in order to push this new product, they produced free cookbooks and distributed them widely, and also promoted it to uh, Jewish customers, because Jews cannot consume, tend, Orthodox Jews tend to not consume meat and dairy together. Uh, so they would say it's a dairy-free alternative to butter, so therefore you can cook your meats in it. And every one of their recipes, the 615 recipes in this cookbook, called for the use of their product, right? And so, a few years later, Procter & Gamble gives the American Heart Association $1.7 million in a, I believe it was a radio show. Uh, they, they won their radio show, right? That's $30 million in today's money, and the American Heart Association back then was not a governing body, per se. They didn't have a lot of, uh, a lot of weight in the uh, legislation. They, they weren't an authorita authoritative figure. So Procter & Gamble really pushed them to power and prominence, so to speak. Um, since then, though, the American Heart Association uh, suggests that we eat less saturated fat and switch to more heart-healthy vegetable oils. Funny that they were funded by the company that produced the vegetable oil. So we released low-fat guidelines in 1976 to 1980 just about, and you can see over here that's right here on the graph. So consumption of this purple, we have vegetable oils, have skyrocketed. Consumption of butter, which is the yellow, has trended down. Margarine peaked, trended down as well, and same thing as lard, another animal-based fat, has also trended way down. Despite that, obesity rates have doubled since 76. Uh, this is up to 2006, and I'm sure they've gone even higher since then. Another contributing factor to how America got to where we are nowadays is this guy. He's a, he had a PhD in ocean, uh, oceanography. This is Ansel Keys, and he was the uh, leading authority figure for helping determine the diet standards in America and uh, really the switch from saturated fat to more unsaturated fats. And in his experiment, the seven countries study, which actually involved 23 countries, he just picked the seven that fit his hypothesis, which was that saturated fat causes heart disease. Uh, those, those seven countries fit his hypothesis, so published it. After that, he led a Minnesota coronary experiment, and in his control, he did not use saturated fat. He used margarine and shortening, so he was comparing the diet of margarine and shortening versus vegetable oils, and found that the vegetable oils were healthier than the, who would have guessed it, the margarine, the other uh, highly hydrogenated trans fat. And then years later, Dr. Ramsden, he's a medical investigator, he reevaluated the raw data, which they had to find a lot of this in a uh, basement. And they uncovered that there was actually a 22% risk of death increase for every 30 milligrams per deciliter decrease in cholesterol in the body. And he actually, a uh, PhD in oceanography, he did go back and get another doctorate in physiology, but. Um, yeah, he is, he is one of the leading figures, and he was heavily funded by the U.S. government as well as, uh, I believe, Eisenhower played a role as well because he had recently suffered a heart attack. And so everyone was kind of on the fritz about why did this president have a heart attack. Well, he smoked, I believe, two packs a day, so that could have contributed to that as well. So here's his research, this graph right here. He's picked his seven countries, and you can see the trending line of saturated or fat calorie as the total percentage of consumed calories compared to the deaths per 1,000. And he found it trended upwards. But he also didn't mention, on this right side, the consumption of sugar followed the exact same trend. Talking about LDL and saturated fat. Uh, this is the 192 country study done by the World Health Organization, so more and more people are now starting to 
uh, look deeper into the saturated fat hypothesis, this one found that in males and females, when there was an increase in mean cholesterol me measured in millimoles per liter, there was a decrease in, decrease in all cause mortality. And that's not just heart disease. Um, this also includes, and, and my take on this, is you, de you deplete cholesterol in the body, you also deplete the building block for vitamin D, you could increase the risk for cancer, things like that. But this is all cause mort mortality. And I um, also want to mention the average cholesterol level of heart attack patients, it's 170.1 milligrams per deciliter. If you look down here, that is a healthy cholesterol level. So the majority, I believe 75% uh, of patients who have a heart attack actually have healthy cholesterol levels. And higher LDL levels are linked to lower all-cause mortality, as we've talked about. And I do want to mention as well, LDL is not cholesterol. A lot of times you say, you know, you need to lower your cholesterol. Uh, LDL is as much as cholesterol as taxis are people. They're a transport molecule for uh, fats and uh, triglycerides and cholesterol itself. So we removed fat from foods. This made them less palatable. So the answer, of course, was to add in sugar. We added sugar into every food. Sugar had a longer, uh, longer shelf life as well. And, and another benefit of vegetable oil for people trying to make money is Vegetable oil also pr uh, provided a longer shelf life for processed foods. And sugar uh, it pr uh, provides a dopamine release, and dopamine plays a leading cause in, uh, or leading factor in addiction. And dopamine should be earned, in my opinion. So dopamine is the reward chemical, reward neurotransmitter that's given after uh, finishing a meaningful task or, or performing an action that your body wants to rewire its brain to perform again. And from an evolutionary, uh, evolutionary take, this is important. If you find a, or if our ancestors found a fruit tree, for example, we're gonna remember where that fruit tree was, we're gonna consume as much as possible. The sugar actually will suppress leptin, which is your satiety hormone, and increase ghrelin, your hunger hormone. So it will tell you, consume more, consume more. We might not get another chance to find a rich source of carbohydrates. Uh, the biological requirement for carbohydrate ingestion is zero. Carbohydrates themselves are needed, uh, but your body can produce any carbohydrates that you do need. And I did want to mention, I believe Harvard first coined the term type 3 diabetes. Alzheimer's is now being linked to insulin resistance. And then most recently, a YouTube channel, Low Carb Down Under, had a medical researcher talking about polycystic ovary syndrome, which is in 6 to 12 percent of uh, reproductive aged women in the U.S., is now being mentioned as type 4 diabetes and has actually been being managed with metformin for some time now. So briefly mentioned the cause of heart disease. We've touched on it in the past in another one of our videos, but looking at the artery and seeing plaque, like in that image up at the top right, and saying that plaque's the problem. Uh, that's, that's only part of the whole picture. The plaque's there for a reason though. The plaque's actually there to help your body, or your body is helping heal the damage done to the artery. So in this case, you can see the plaque's underneath a layer. That plaque's actually within the artery wall and it's the arteries going to the arteries called the vasovasorum that have had inflammation and damage. And so the body is now having to repair that. So a, a new take on heart disease is that inflammation is actually the culprit and not the consumption of fats, uh, not the consumption of saturated fats specifically. So I did want to mention blaming plaque under the artery wall is like uh, looking at a firefighter putting out a fire and being like, that, that guy's the problem. He's, he's the issue. Uh, it makes no sense. So uh, I did want to mention as well, you can see on this, this graph, uh, the total cholesterol here is listed, and it's kind of a U-shaped curve. Low cholesterol can be just as dangerous as high cholesterol. The blue is cardiac deaths, so heart-related illness, and then the red is all-cause mortality. So in this, ideally, you know, you would be somewhere between 180, 260. You're pretty safe with total cholesterol levels. LDLC, LDL is the one that a lot of medical doctors will tell you generally you want zero. Uh, you want no LDL. 
I'm gonna emphasize again, your body makes LDL as needed, and there's a reason for that. Uh, there's new drugs called, you know, as we know, statins typically are what they prescribe. They're now coming out with a new drug called PSK, PSCK9 inhibitors, which ridiculously powerful. They can bring statins, they can make statins look extremely weak and they'll bring cholesterol LDL levels uh, down to extremely low levels, in my opinion. Um, the average level was, they brought LDL down to 40 milligrams per deciliter, which would take this off the chart to the left. So essential function of cholesterol, essential functions. Uh, they're part of cell membranes. They help us make vitamin D, which as we know is, is not a vitamin, uh, but a pro-hormone, and it helps us fight infection, staves off cancer. A lot of us don't get enough sunlight as it is, and you want to have enough cholesterol to have the building blocks to make vitamin D when you do get sun exposure. It also assists with sex hormone production. It helps you break down fats, absorb nutrients, aids in digestion, and I believe half your brain is also made of cholesterol. So extremely important to not take away those building blocks, especially uh, your brain is never stop, is never finished really remodeling itself. So neuroplasticity is a thing. Your brain's constantly rewiring and repairing itself. We want to give it all the building blocks in order to do so. So a little bit more about how we got to where we are. You can see on the right, we have the American Heart Association's biggest donors and the American Diabetes Association's biggest donors. Uh, I want to mention that the 10 top producers of anti-diabetic medications are all on this list in the middle. So these donors, which their respective earnings here on the right, 14.26 billion for Nova Nordisk, for example, um, they're on here and they're a major, uh, major proponent and major uh, sponsor for the American Diabetes Association. And that's a minor conflict of interest, to say the least. Also mentioned, uh, when, when reviewers leave the FDA, 57.7% of them, this is on the low end, then go on to work for the pharmaceutical and agricultural industry. And as we saw in a video that's recently gone viral, uh, one of the top employees for Pfizer is caught on tape mentioning that the FDA tends to go a little bit easier on them because they eventually might want to work at their company in the future. So what is the ideal diet? I get this question all the time. I'm going to go ahead and say that depends on your personal requirements and your own individual metabolism. In my opinion, your ancestry, genetics, epigenetics all play a role. I think based on what my parents, their parents, and their parents thrived on would be better tailored toward what I could handle to eat. So I would say someone who comes from a more equatorial uh, someone from Mexico whose families and generations have grown up on corn and maize could probably thrive better on a more carbohydrate-rich diet. Personally, I've done vegan for a year. I've done now carnivore. It'll be a year next week and found that, in my opinion, uh, I'm, I'm thriving on my current diet and I'm going to stick with it for a little bit longer. But I go into a little bit more specifics here. If you suffer from kidney stones, maybe avoid oxalates and oxalate-rich green leafy plants. Nutrient deficiencies, maybe avoid phytates, uh, which bind to minerals and keep them from getting absorbed. Uh, and lectins as well. Gluten intolerance, that we know now it's gotten popular, avoid bread and wheat. Uh, we know celiac disease is getting more and more common these days. If you got hemochromatosis, You'll laugh at that one. We had a professor who would say uh, hemochromatosis. He uh, avoid red meats. So these are patients who can't properly digest iron and, and have iron overload pretty quickly. Uh, autoimmune issue. Identify your sensitivities and uh, specific toxins toxins through an elimination diet or food sensitivity test. And always stick to clean, ethically sourced, grass-fed, grass-finished meats and uh, dairy and as well as organic produce. So avoid, avoid the extra toxins uh, in your bucket, so to speak. Uh, the, the glyphosate that we now know is, is wreaking harm on people's guts and things like that. So I also want to mention this chart up here on the top right. Simple test, uh, they test subjects, and this one consumed oysters, a zinc-rich food, something I personally think is disgusting to eat, but they are high in zinc. When they consumed the zinc, uh, rich oysters alone, you can see the hours after dose 1, 2, 3, and 4, the levels of zinc in the plasma. 
compared to when they eat the same amount of oysters with black beans and corn tortillas, uh, they actually block the absorption of zinc into the plasma. So interesting study there. And that'll do it for me. Uh, Dr. Tiffany's now going to tell us a little bit more about the gut-brain axis. Yep. Good. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I wanted to talk about the connection that your gut and what you consume um, has with your mood and your brain and function cognitively. Um, so when we talk about the gut, I know Dr. Mike mentioned the word microbiome earlier, but the gut itself is the the group or or community of bacteria and fungi and even sometimes viruses that inhabits your digestive system, um, so your large and small intestine. Um, now, we do have bacteria all over our body, so inside, outside, on our skin. We are, are colonized by all these small organisms, and some of them perform a function to help our body do what it needs to do. So without them, we would be really sad. Um, so that's how the brain and, and gut communicate. So um, the bacteria in our gut can influence what neurotransmitters are produced, and we'll talk about that in a second, but most of the serotonin, the feel-good um, and anti-anxiety neurotransmitter, is produced in your gut. Um, and that can drive whether you're in a stressed or an anxious state or whether you're in a relaxed state. And then the brain also then influences the way your digestive tract moves through moves food through um, the secretion of mucus the things that you want to eat are influenced by that and then how we develop our gut is um, through a couple ways but the first way is when we're born so we start to develop our microbiome in utero but the big first colonization is whenever the baby travels through the vaginal canal and literally takes in the flora of the mother and we'll see in just a moment how um, c-sections actually decrease that and it's harder for children to build that flora um, over the next six months of their life when they miss out on that. That's the wrong direction. Okay, so like I said, we first have the major colonization during birth. Um, when we have a C-section, the baby doesn't get the microbiome from the mother. And all I could you know, find of what do they get was you get the bacteria in the environment, good, bad, or ugly. So sometimes we're giving birth in hospitals where there are literally anything near you. Um, so you may get things you don't want to. Uh, hospitals are where sick people go. Um, so it's obviously not ideal. And then through breastfeeding, that starts to continue to grow the baby's microbiome as they age. And then when we start to introduce foods, same thing, they start to um, diversify the flora in their gut. And then I have antibiotics on here. So when we take an antibiotic, which sometimes children are given right at birth, that kills good and bad bacteria. So while we're aiming to get rid of any bad possible bacteria, we are killing good as well. Again, the wrong direction. Um, so some studies about this, uh, whenever we study mice because we can't study humans and give and take away their flora. Um, some sh studies with mice show that the microbiome plays an important role in their mood. So some mice were given, or some mice exhibited characteristics of being more outgoing, less worried, less fearful, um, and they would actually jump off a platform within seconds of being placed on the platform where other mice showed that they were more anxious, more cautious, and they took up to four minutes to move off of the platform. And when they switched microbiomes, they introduced some of the flora from mice to the fearful mice, they would move faster. Um, and then the more outgoing mice would move slower and be more cautious once those microbiome had been transplanted. And then we also have seen uh, in human cases where for some reason they needed to have a fecal microbiome transplant. And usually that's for treatment of a bad bacteria so that they can recolonize and try to get them back to a healthier state. And um, in the case that I was looking at, 
this was a transplant from a teenage daughter to a mother and the mother recovered you know from the reason of the transplant but she also gained like 30 or 40 pounds in a couple of months because she received microbiome or the the flora from her daughter who was overweight so your bacteria can directly affect your body specifically and it's different for everyone it's different among even identical twins they're going to have a different gut flora because of you know any reason they you know started from birth but also what they've taken in since then and then in another study that i heard about um, we look at pro um, propionic acid which is an acid that is um, created from a certain type of clostridium bacteria and that bacteria um, that that PPA is a byproduct of that. So you can find that in feces of people who have that bacteria in their microbiome. But when they injected that acid into the brains of mice, they had increased neuroinflammation, they had increased oxidative stress, which is uh, cell damage, and they had decreased glutathione and abnormal movements, repetitive movements, um, repetitive interests, cognitive deficits, and impaired social interactions. And so all of those um, signs and symptoms are hallmark for autism spectrum disorder. And so sometimes parents have mentioned that whenever their children started showing signs of losing um, milestones, essentially, it was after rounds of antibiotics. So that can be one factor um, that can be contributed to that autism spectrum disorder. So clostridium, um, ASD, and then the PPA levels in the feces. So in um, patients with autism spectrum disorder, if they have high levels of clostridium bacteria in their microbiome, we will see that acid in their feces, thus linking the acid within their body that could be contributing to their symptoms. Um, so like we talked about, uh, serotonin is produced in the gut, so that's your anti-anxiety and positive joy mood. Um, neurotransmitter. Uh, GABA is also can be produced from the microbiome in the gut. And GABA is uh, inhibitory, so it will slow down connections between nerve cells. And that can play a major role in Parkinson's, <clears throat> but that also can be involved in anxiety whenever we have that constant neural firing or we're overstimulated by the environment you can see those anxiety symptoms arise and then also dopamine the motivation neurotransmitter is produced by the bacteria in your gut as well so you want to have the good balance of good bacteria over bad bacteria so you're getting the things you need to improve that gut brain connection and then we're going to talk about leaky gut syndrome. So we're taking a little jump from just the gut-brain axis itself, but talking more about how the gut um, can become inflamed and things that happen because of that. So um, what leaky gut syndrome is, is it's increased permeability of the intestines. So your intestines um, on the very inside part where we're absorbing nutrients have one cell layer that lines that intestine. And that cell layer should be really tight together so it can control what goes into the blood from your intestines. So what you absorb, it wants to control. And you should see tight junctions, so we shouldn't have any gaps in between those cells, but we can have leaky junctions for a number of reasons. And when that happens, we get unwanted food particles, so um, it can even be lesser digested food particles, so large molecules going into the bloodstream, and then pathogens can enter as well. And what we get from that is an immune response. So our body says, okay, something bad is happening. We need to mobilize an attack to protect ourselves from it. And common symptoms of that are abdominal pain, asthma, uh, joint and muscle pain. We can have gas and bloating. We can have or memory, irritability, fatigue, rashes, headaches, constipation, mood swings, and anxiety. So these are a lot of varied symptoms. You know, that those are things that probably every single one of them I could attribute to another health condition, but when a lot of times it could be straight from your gut. 
And then when left untreated, that can result in more severe issues like irritable bowel syndrome, um, arthritis, eczema, chronic fatigue. And then we're looking um, at studies also implicating leaky gut and type 2 diabetes. Um, so inflammation from a leaky gut can damage the beta cells of the pancreas and then drive insulin resistance. And then you get into the cycle now where you have to have supplemental help with your blood sugar levels. And then also nutrient and mineral imbalances because we're having decreased absorption because the body is mounting an immune response and we're not having fully digested particles of food. So the ways that we can damage the gut lining, there are very many. Um, that can be chronic stress, that can be um, overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine, and that comes from sometimes obstruction in the bowels, but there can be other reasons. Um, environmental contaminants, so the toxins coming into your barrel, excess alcohol, use of uh, non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs, um, and then long-term use of other medications, so like um, antibiotics, uh, antidepressants, birth control, things like that, and then smoking and poor diet. So with poor diet, you know, Dr. Jordan covered a lot of that. The big thing that I wanted to point out was the heavily processed foods. So those foods that are low in nutrients, that are inflammatory, usually have the refined carbohydrates, right, to make them taste better, so we crave them more. But that also decreases the diversity of your microbiome. So whenever you're not getting the foods that feed your microbiome in, you're going to lose some of the beneficial bacteria and allow the um, non-beneficial bacteria to start to take over. Um, so we're going to get into kind of treating leaky gut syndrome, things you can do to help um, avoid it. Uh, supplements are not going to mask your unhealthy diet, though. So I'm going to mention a couple of things that can be taken, but I don't like those to be taken without change in the diet as well. But the best way to find what you're sensitive to uh, that could be contributing to that leaky gut is by doing an elimination diet. So I know we talk about the advanced plan a lot. That's a good way to try to rule out things that are bothering you to get rid of. Um, so things like gluten, sugar, vegetable oils, those are the big ones we want to go ahead and eliminate so that we can try to find what is the cause. So one of the things that we can do to help with leaky gut syndrome is L-glutamine. It's uh, one of the most used amino acids in the body. It's a protein building block. We can make it ourselves in our body, but you can also get it from meat and dairy, raw spinach and beans, and uh, studies have shown that it not only helps decrease that permeability, so the gapping in the intestines, but it also can help with healing and preventing ulcers in the stomach. And then we have bone broth. Um, so bone broth has collagen and amino acids in it to help deal with damaged cell walls. And this is a great way to start with elimination. Some people will do bone broth fasts so that they can kind of get everything out and then slowly work back in while also helping heal their gut. And the collagen can help with that too because as we age, collagen decrease, collagen production decreases. So if we take in those building blocks, we can help. Um, you can make bone broth yourself or you can purchase it. So whenever you make it yourself, you wanna have at least a six hour simmer on your bones. So it's gonna be bones, water typically. Um, you can make a stock and that's similar to bone broth, but a stock is typically gonna be bones. Um, you can have meat too in a stock. You'll add in vegetables, whatever, to give it more flavor and depth. But the bone broth is kind of special just because it's the bones themselves. Um, whenever you purchase, like I said, you can look at broth versus stock, but you wanna look at the cook time because bone broths can be called a bone broth if they just boiled bones and water together, but there's no limit on the time for calling it a broth whenever we buy a, um, a produced bone broth. Um, and they say the longer the better to get the collagen from your bones. So some people will even um, simmer their bones for 24 or 48 hours. Uh, and like I said, good for elimination. So that's something to start with. Then we can look at the probiotics. So like I said, you have good bacteria in and on your body. And the probiotics are the good guys. Those are the things that keep your gut flora um, functioning well and well diversified. 
Um, but since every microbiome is different, you know, you do want to make sure that you're getting varied diet to support that. Uh, you can find probiotics in fermented foods and drinks. Um, so kefir, kombucha, sauerkraut, kimchi, which is a fermented um, cabbage, uh, pickles, apple cider vinegar, um, and what you feed will grow. So if you help feed your probiotics, your good microbiota, um, they're going to be the ones that are predominant and working for you. So you can feed uh, prebiotics. So those are things like garlic, onions, asparagus, and broccoli. And essentially a prebiotic is um, a less easily digested fiber or an indigestible fiber that your gut bacteria will ferment themselves to use on their own. And then we have uh, two other honorable mentions that I like to add in. So digestive enzymes, um, these are things that help break down your fats, uh, carbs, and proteins to aid in digestion. So those are going to help you limit the large molecules that are undigested um, that can be passing through those leaky junctions. Um, and then the licorice root, this is more for support of the digestive tract, and it's also an adaptogen that can help you balance production and metabolism of cortisol so that you can work on stress levels since stress is a contributing factor to leaky gut syndrome. All right, and that's all we have. Do you have any questions? I know it's varied topics this evening. Excellent. Any questions that anybody has, of course, we can uh, ask away on, on the uh, comments on YouTube. Uh, send us a message. But, uh, you know, the biggest thing is just make sure that, you, you know, you're, you're paying attention to all seven of the homeostatic essentials that, you know, you don't just get caught focused on one. That's mm -hmm. why we're doing this whole series on those seven because uh, each one interplays with the next. You know, you can't just just because you exercise and you're in the gym all the time doesn't mean that you're healthy. You know, we've, there's lots of people taking all kinds of medications that are in the gym every mm -hmm. week. Um, there's lots of people that eat all the organic diets that are still sick. Um, you know, we have a lot of even chiropractic patients that still have other problems, you know, and it's because we're not really putting all those things into play together. So, uh, that's why we keep them loud and proud on the wall there, you know, so that every single time that patients are in our clinic, they're reminded that respiration, detoxification, sunlight, nutrition, hydration, physical balance, and mental balance, all those things are important. So uh, any questions, ask away, uh, but have a great night otherwise. Yeah, thank you. That was excessive. Stop clapping now. I almost mentioned, like, Safe, but you're, you're very safe. Mm -hmm. You can trade safety for freedom.